Um, there we go. Yes, of course you have. And you've all drunk good South Australian wine too. I know that's the case. Uh, our keynote is, um, well, it's, it's the question, isn't it? A good death for all. What would it take? To take you through the elements of that, you have Dr. Hal Alex Harad today, Director and Professor of the Institute for Global Health Equity and Innovation at the University of Toronto. All good things come from Canada. To introduce him, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Keith Evans, Group Advisor, Public Policy with Silver Chain, one of our key sponsors and backers for this conference. Please welcome Keith Evans. Thank you, Virginia, and good morning. Um, you, you're going to be exposed to a wonderful experience shortly. This is not part of the wonderful experience. This is what you have to put up with because we are a sponsor of this event. And so, I'm, but I'm, I'm delighted to be here, partly because, of course, it is in Adelaide where I happen to live. And the beauty of this event and the juxtaposition you'll see is you'll hear a Welsh person, me, introducing a Colombian, Alex, and you'll see how very different the cultures are. My culture is a culture of the glass is not only not half empty, there's nothing in it at all. <laughs> Alex is of the, the glass is full to overflowing and I'm not even sure there's a glass there at all. And so I do go gentle into this good night, and I am one of those who will rage against the dying of the light. We have this wonderful opportunity to hear Alex Haddad, who, as you know, is a physician and an educator and a researcher, an entrepreneur, a, a bright light in an area that requires significant bright light. Somebody who questions the basis on which we do the things we do to each other, for each other, and around each other. You can read all the things that have been said about Alex in, in the papers that you have and on the app. But fundamentally, what I believe, having read extensively around him, is that what he does is that he questions the basis on which we choose to be engaged in and see the way in which people, as some, some others have said, become the authors of the last chapters of their lives. Silver Chain is delighted to support this event, particularly delighted to support the fact that Alex is here. Our vision is to deliver world's best health and aged care so that people can choose to live their lives as they wish. It is about choice. And fundamentally, we don't spend enough time reacting to, responding to, and providing for people the choice they want at this most vulnerable, at that most vulnerable time of their lives. So I'm delighted to introduce Alex, who will take over now and hopefully will finish on time. But you are going to have a real treat. So, Alex, thank you very much. Well, 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 um, it's really a joy already to be here. Let's make it even more joyful. Okay? So I want to, to make a deal. Um, what if we become accomplices for the next uh, 40 minutes or so? And I want to issue the invitation uh, to you too, who might be watching this from a different place and at some point uh, at a different time, uh, to go into space where um, all our assumptions could be questioned. And this is why I decided to start with a question. What would it take for every human being to have a good death? My good friend Scott Murray uh, from Scotland uh, taught me one day that uh, the numbers are staggering. The prevalence of human mortality continues to be uh, the same all over the world. It's 100% in South America, 100% in North America, 100% in Europe, 100% in Asia, 
100% in North America, 100% in, in Australasia or in Australia. Um, so we are all going to die, and, and most people here, there, everywhere would acknowledge that. So the issue is not, are we going to die? The answer is yes. But please raise your hand uh, if you would like to have a bad death. <laughs> raise your hand. For the record, and for those of you who are watching this at a different place, possibly in a different time, uh, not a single hand went up. So if we don't want a bad death, how could we ensure that we have a good one? Who would like to have a good death? Okay. For the record again, 100%. And um, so you had me at a better future. Because I think we are very good at dying badly. And I think we have plenty of evidence to show how good we are at dying badly. And we keep coming to meetings to talk about how things could be better. And, and things seem to be getting worse. So um, what if we had the opportunity to pause? Because most of us are under pressure to do, to do, to do, to answer, to answer, to answer. Most of us are rewarded for being certain, for being sure, to respond with confidence and very quickly. And most of us have made it to where we are because of that, we learn how to answer, and to answer with a lot of confidence. But what if we give ourselves permission to press that button and to pause? And to wonder, what is the question? Okay. This is attributed to Einstein. Most likely, he never said it. And uh, paraphrasing, just to give you the brief version, uh, he was asked, what would you do if you had one hour to solve a problem and your life depended on it? He said, easy. I would spend the first 55 minutes trying to figure out what the question is. Because once I figure out the question, I can solve any problem in five minutes. So what is our question? Why are we here? What is motivating our presence here? Why do we do what we do? And, and how much time have we spent thinking about it? As some of you know, I'm wondering what my role is. I'm a physician by training. But what is it to be a physician? What, what am I meant to do? What's my essence? What justifies my existence? I really don't know. Because it forces me to think about what is that that I do that justifies a medical degree? What is it that I do that somebody else couldn't do? Either just as well or better without a medical degree. And I, I really don't have an answer for that. And I think we have a lot to answer to society to justify our existence. So why do we exist if we call ourselves palliative care people? What justifies our existence? So um, I couldn't help it. I went to Palliative Care Australia. I said, okay, if, if, if the challenge is to build a better future, let's see where we are at now. So I cannot help it. I love questions. And there was one right there. What is palliative care? It says palliative care is care that helps people live life as fully and as comfortably as possible when living with a life-limiting or terminal illness. I want that. Yeah? And then the site also offers the uh, statement from the World Health Organization on what palliative care is. And then I looked at these two things and said, is there anything missing there? Is there anything missing there? And there is a biggie missing there. Okay. 
we really don't talk about death. And we are trying to promote a change in culture. And, and Palliative Care Australia is really trying to bring about a change in culture to make the conversation about death normal, to socialize it, as we call it these days. So the first opportunity we have is to put death right there. And that would be easy for us to do. We have the leaders of the organization here. So what would happen if we put the word death there and then send a communicate to the World Health Organization and say, hey, why is the word death missing? And send a suggested text to the World Health Organization about how we should conceptualize palliative care. And if it doesn't change, say, why, why, why are you refusing to put the word death there? What's going on here? What game are we playing? Have we fallen into a trap, into the same trap that we are trying to dismantle? The trap of the medicalization of life until the very end. We have medicalized death. And there are major healthcare organizations, big ones, and I can tell you, some of the biggest cancer centers in the world forbid the word, the word death. I have colleagues in palliative care who have to talk about plan B. Yeah, plan B, you know, if the treatment doesn't work, hmm, then we need to activate plan B. <laughs> so we need to start by saying, hey, it's very difficult for us to promote the notion of palliative care using the word death because people are afraid of the word death. So to try to get into the game, we better avoid it until the time comes and then we can mention it. But the time doesn't seem to be coming. And we may be falling into the same trap. So here it is. First thing that I think we could do is to insert the word death there and to see how we would do it. How would we do it? Yeah. And I had the fortune to deliver um, my daughter and her sister and then our two grandchildren. Uh, my grandfather delivered me and delivered my brother and his children. Now I'm grandpa who had the privilege to deliver the grandchildren. The last one in a corridor in a building on the 22nd of July of 2017, unexpectedly with bare hands. Um, and this was recent and, and, and we were trying as a family to fight the medicalization of birth. Because in countries like Colombia, most um, babies are born through cesarean sections these days. In the city where Emilio, our grandson, was born, uh, the rate in some areas is over 80% because it's easier for everybody. But one thing that differentiates us from the obstetricians is that they talk about the birth. So it's almost inimaginable to talk about maternity care without mentioning birth. But it seems possible to talk about palliative care, not mentioning death. What the heck? Huh? So I think there is an opportunity for us when we are pressing that pause button to say, hmm, what's happening to us? Because remember, and there is one of uh, those expressions who seem to be validated over and over again. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So there may be good motivations for not mentioning death in relation to palliative care, but it may be doing more harm than good now. So enough is enough, is my point. First one. And it's easy, we can do it, so let's do it. Okay. Now. If we agree with that, and we need to validate whether we agree with an approach like this, then another question emerges. So raise your hand if you think that a good death should be part of the scope explicitly of palliative care. Okay? Who doesn't think a good death explicitly should be part of the scope of palliative care? 
Okay, so who is not sure? Who doesn't care? I mean, we are about 80% of the response rate uh, now to that question. So most people say, yeah, good death. So probably just qualifying death with a good, you see, with good may help us figure out how to insert it into our conceptualizations of palliative care. But this also creates yet another interesting challenge or opportunity, depending on how we want to take this. What do we mean by it? We all want it. But how would we recognize it when we say it? What do we mean by a good death? We know we don't want a bad one. We all raised our hands okay, in response to the question, would you like to have a good death? What is it? And who is to say? Who has the legitimacy or the authority to declare a death as good? Is it somebody like me, a physician? I'm not that sure. We know very little about death. I fret when I participate in conversations about physician, assisted, or whatever other term you want to use, death. Who are we to have such power if we have neglected this or we consider the entity as an enemy? So if we are prepared to challenge and by the way, my mentor, Murray Enkin, when I met him, I heard this expression that then I have noticed throughout my life. He said, sacred cows make the best burgers. <laughs> yeah. So who is to say? Yeah. Are we are trying to motivate as much community engagement. Well, the community, okay, who is the community? How do we go about this? Yeah. And I'm going to break some rules here. There are some microphones. If you want to say something, say it. If you don't have a microphone, shout, and I will repeat it from here. Because what I'm doing is inviting you to engage in dialogue here. And, and there is a possibility of a silent dialogue. In fact, some of the most important dialogues that we can have is with our inner voice. And I want to invite all of us to listen to our inner voice. Okay. Some people call it our conscience. But we have this voice inside our heads. Only we can hear it. Nobody else can. But we tend to ignore it. So let's unleash our inner voice through the rest of this conversation. What do we mean by a good death? Hear what, what your inner voice is saying. And notice it. Notice it. Because I will be speaking through my outer voice to our inner voices for the rest of this time we have the opportunity to share today. Okay. So, what is a good day? And even if the answer is I don't know, that's okay. And there is one hand up here. Okay, there you go. A good death is a death when the people uh, who are around the person who's dying are comfortable with what's happening. Okay, that's, that's fine. And I appeal to the other inner voices here to see how we react to a statement like this. And when we're trying to make decisions, then one of the difficulties we face is that the person who speaks first usually triggers groupthink. So we need to be very careful. This is why brainstorming is so challenging. Whoever speaks first or with the most Confidence tends to deviate the agenda. So I'm going to stop a little bit here and again continue the invitation to engage our inner voices for a little bit, okay? To avoid steering things in one direction or another because there is also a big body of literature on this. And again, um, it's easy to recognize a bad death. In fact, I would like to propose that a bad death be considered a violation of human rights. Yeah. 
What would happen if we decided to do that as a palliative care community? And we enabled the community, the community with capital C, to be activated and to say, if I get a blood test done in the next 24 hours of life, that's a violation of my human rights. I can sue you. I wonder, I'm not saying we should do it, but I'm wondering, because I think we are too nice, and we have become accomplices most of the time. We keep witnessing, witnessing bad deaths, and oh, the system, the government, the, perver the perverse incentive, incentives under which I operate, and who am I? I don't have power, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And now around the world, all the, all, all the, the series we look at indicate that, what, 80% of people die in institutions when 80% of people would like to die at home, for example. Still a huge proportion of people are dying in pain. And Australia, like the UK and Canada, are three countries from which we have data. When we compare the amount of education that health professionals get on pain management, for example, in these three countries, we have discovered that vets get three to five times more training on pain management than medical students, or nursing students, or horrifyingly, dentistry students. <laughs> and when we look at the availability of opioids still around the world, less than 20% of the opioids, or less than 20% uh, of the opioids are available to more than 80% of the population. Should we take a government to The Hague when they make it difficult for people to have access to painkillers? That's a gross violation of human rights if people are dying in pain because regulations or whatever you want to call them make it more difficult than it should be. Because we don't need to prove that opioids relieve pain. What happens when we start thinking in those terms? Instead of how I'm going to deal with the particular case I have in front of me, or the community that I have committed to supporting. So what's our denominator when we are talking about palliative care? How many people are we meant to be supporting, to have if you accept it, a good death. How do we know what the denominator is? Yeah. It could be argued that it's everybody on the world, in the world, everybody. Seven and a half billion people plus. And then most people say, oops, that's probably too much. Okay, then the people who are dying, okay, how many people are dying? How many people died in Australia last month? Last week, yesterday, who knows? Last year, how many people die in Australia every year? Last year, 2016, sorry? Around, what does it mean around? If that should be recorded, if there is anything the government records, is how many people die because it has tax implications. So we should be able to describe the number right to the last one, okay? Because those are the people who basically made up the population that, at least in theory, should benefit from palliative care. And the fact is that we don't know here in this room. And pull out your computers, get them out, and see if you can get an answer from those machines. <laughs> and make them valuable for once. But you see, we don't know how many people died in our own country in the previous year, or the previous week, or the previous month. Why not? 3,302. 3,302 where? In Australia. 3,000? Last year. You see, that number, you see, interesting. You see, well, now we are getting. Somewhere, okay? Oh, wait a second. 
And by the, okay, okay, okay. The number is coming. The number is coming. Are you? Are we finding this useful? By the way, this is a good moment for me to 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 pause a bit too and and ensure that what I'm doing, which is full of love and good intentions, is 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 of value. Are you enjoying this so far? Are you finding it useful? Any suggestions to improve the way in which I'm doing what I'm doing? Okay, if you have any, raise your hand. Sorry? I think the high fifth chair is responsible for all the doctors and all the communities, not only for the health. Okay, uh, palliative care is a responsibility of every physician, not just the palliative care physicians. Okay, that's fine, but the question is what's our denominator, you see? Regardless of what the, the group that will be there to satisfy them is. Okay, so I tried to figure out how many people died in the world last year. And uh, as far as I know, we don't know. <laughs> The best figures we have come from the World Health Organization, and they tend to be two years old. So what did you find? 159,052 in 2015. And I challenge you to see if you can find the data from 2016. Yeah. So you see, there is something interesting here. But let's say that the number would be similar for 2016. How many of those had a good death? How many of them had a bad death? How much we could have contributed to changing the reality for the loss of these folks? Where have we been as palliative care community in each of these deaths? And we could start asking the question with the 159,052 who in the year 2015 died in Australia. How many of them had a bad death? How many of them had a good death? What do we mean? And who is to say? Yeah. That begs another question. What are the main causes of death? Okay, because knowing what is causing the death may help us guide our decisions about the kind of services we provide to people to ensure that they have a good death. What are the main causes of death? Number one. Sorry? Heart disease. Okay. Number two. In Australia, you mean? You see, cancer, dementia. Uh, some people could claim that it's polypathology because now it's almost impossible to find somebody with one condition, but that we have coding systems that force us to put one as the dominant diagnosis. The most common or the commonest chronic condition is multiple chronic conditions. And we all know that. Those who are in the trenches know that it's not this person died of a heart disease. Okay, it's usually a constellation, but we have fragmented reality so much that we are forced to create categories like this. And these are the figures, again, from 2015 from the World Health Organization. And, and uh, it says 8.6 million, almost 8.8 .8 million as a result of ischemic heart disease. 6.2 million as a result of stroke. Then 3.2 million due to lower respiratory infections then COPD, then weirdly, trachea, bronchus, and lung cancers. I wonder why not cancer, okay? Even though cancer is a questionable term these days, it's not a disease. It seems to be something that is different for each person, which is creating big challenges for all of us. Then diabetes, then dementia. You see? And this is what the World Health Organization says. Are we comfortable with these labels? Because all of these things, except for the last one, which is road injury, 1.3 million, okay? road injuries. All of the others are the diagnoses given by people like me. This is one of the greatest expressions of the medicalization of death. We die with a label given by medicine, not by nursing yet, by medicine. Are we satisfied with this? Did my grandfather die of dementia? 
did the dementia kill my grandfather or his Parkinson's disease? Was your last patient killed by diabetes? Or is it a manifestation of this system in which we find ourselves that forces us with our willing participation to medicalize death? What would happen if we looked at things through a different lens? What if we removed the medical lens from death and looked at other data sets? Okay. 12.6 million deaths are linked to the environment. More than heart disease, more than ischemic heart disease. What do we do with this? What's our role? And there is a lot of greed involved here. And a lot of government complicity to allow this to happen. And this is 12.6 million. Then insensitivity seems to be killing more people than cancer, or every other disease on that list except ischemic heart disease. Eight million people seem to die every year because of hunger alone. In a world that has an abundance of food, for God's sake, dying of hunger, isn't that a bad death that could be prevented? To the point that the biggest authority of the United Nations said, that each of these deaths, and there are 21,000 children who will die today of hunger in a world that has an abundance of food. More people seem to be dying today as a result of an excess of food and obesity-related conditions than of hunger. He said each of these deaths, one every four seconds, by the way, is a murder, and we are accomplices. The FAO, the entity of the United Nations that is responsible for food, estimated a few years ago that we need $30 billion a year to eradicate hunger. $30 billion. In Canada, a couple of years ago, we estimated that 35 million people wasted $107 billion worth of food. 35 million people wasted $107 billion dollars worth of food in a world in which with 30 billion we could eradicate hunger. What's our role? Is that part of our scope? One every four seconds. Since I mentioned that figure, probably 20 kids died. Do we really care? Or are we psychopaths? Because we don't care, really. OK, now, next. Talk about the clinical thing, Alex. Because I'm here to try to figure out how to relieve pain and how to improve the efficiencies of my teams or how to advocate. These kind of things make us uncomfortable. And I think we need to be uncomfortable. Because if not, we are part of the problem. Sexism, okay. being a woman is very dangerous. Okay. 200 million women are unaccounted for in the world now, more than 40 million in China alone, to the point that this group that created the documentary It's a Girl says that these are the three deadliest words in the world. It's a girl. And if our hearts break when we hear about the six million people who died in the Holocaust, we should be outraged at this. Feticide, femicide, 
and ultrasound machines being associated with most of these cases. It's a girl, get her out. Countries like China, India, and many others doing it. Our own countries doing it. Just like genital mutilation is happening in our countries. Yeah. We should be outraged by this. Yeah. And then people like Gary No and his team decided in 2001 to stand in front of the mirror and say, how are we contributing to this as medicine? And Ivan Illich, amongst other people, introduced the term iatrogenesis, which means harm caused by medicine. And when Gary No estimated the numbers and, and lumped up the deaths associated with adverse events from medication or complications of interventions or errors, iatrogenesis became the number one cause of mortality in the US in the year 2001. One million people. Yeah. Almost 50% more than ischemic heart disease almost twice as much as those attributed to cancer. Okay. And what do we do about it? How can we turn this around? Okay. So should we focus in a little wider way. And I had the fortune to write this piece that almost nobody wanted to publish with Murray Enkin, my closest friend and mentor. And the European Journal of Palliative Care decided to publish it. And it's very difficult to get because it's behind the firewall. So if you want a copy, let me know. For your personal use, I will make it available. Have we, as a species, crossed the line of no return? And now we are facing our end. What if nuclear Armageddon actually becomes a reality? We thought that those days were over. What's our role? What's our role? We are the people who know more about death and dying in the world. What kind of provisions are we making? What kind of statements are we issuing? If there is one group that has a legitimacy to talk about death and a good death and a bad death and how to avoid bad death and all that is us. And what are we doing? Looking at our navels. How many milligrams of these bloody things should we give? You understand? And how many beds do we need? Okay? And are nurses valued enough? And how can we advocate for the politicians in our local areas to do this or that when the world is falling apart around us? and then trying to legitimize ourselves. We are specialists. And then we create a specialty. We are certifying people. We fell into the same trap. You are not a palliative care specialist. Where is your certification? Hmm? Contributing to the medicalization of what should be normal. Yeah. And are we doing our best, even at the individual level? That's our response. I'm looking after my patients. Okay? I found myself as a patient in my own hospital almost 10 years ago. And I said, shit, I'm going to die. <laughs> I've spent most of my life speaking in third person. But I am going to die. I am going to die. <gasps> what a realization. Would I like to die as my patients are dying now? Raise your hand if you would like to die as your patients are dying now. For the record, three hands, four and a half out of 800. Then what the heck? What are we doing? And this is more than half obtained in most meetings recently. Usually it's zero. 
I'm very proud of what I'm doing, but I don't want to die as my patients are dying. Wow. Okay? I could stop here. We need to press the pause button and reflect with humility and with generosity. Then we would become the healers. We know we are. And remove all these excuses we use for not doing what we know we should be doing. And that's how I found, yeah, with horrible gowns. I didn't know if I had to put them with the opening in the front and expose my penis or my ass, okay? <laughs> Hundreds of people have worn this. And we spend $200 billion a year in healthcare in Canada, $50 billion in Ontario alone, and we cannot even have decent gowns, okay? And look at who designed those rooms, sadists, okay? <laughs> and then this inevitably came. What is a good death for me? Okay, then enlisted a group of people, and I have the fortune to work with somebody who at some point will not be a graduate student, Marine Saman. And we have gone through 729 publications that have good death on the title. What would the literature say? And then we had the opportunity in Colombia to survey a group of people, 2,971 people working in a network of facilities called the Sanitas OSI group. And this was about the only group that agreed to do this. And we asked them, how would you like to die? Not how would you like your patients to die. Imagine that you have three months to live. What are the non-negotiable things for you for you, 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 not the patients, not third person stuff. Because we are very good. There are lots of publications. The patients want this, the patients want that, the families. No, what would you like? Okay? And we got 85% response rate. And more than 50% of people picked one of these three reasons as their top choice. Dying at our place of choice, pain relief, and having my family and friends around me. Okay? We had seven more, but I would let you read the paper just to honor Maureen and her work. That in more than 50% of cases, we don't need specialists. We don't need sophisticated infrastructure. We don't need the politicians. We just need the willingness to actually get it done. We don't need a physician like me to do this. Because in most cases, we could protocolize pain management, really. And I'm a pain specialist. Really, you don't need me. It's the ignorance about pain management that justifies my existence as a pain specialist, for God's sake. Because vets get to learn more about pain management than medical students or nursing students or dental students, dentistry students. But, but those three things we could do. Okay? And for more than 50%, that would be a good death. I want to die where I choose, with no pain or manageable pain, and with people who love me around. <laughs> and I think we can do it if we make it a priority. Because that's what we want for ourselves. And this is the best data set we have. We went through the 729 publications. Nobody had done this simple thing, which is to ask people who are in charge of this what they would like. The question is, if we should have higher aspirations, is that enough? Would I be satisfied with those three plus the other seven, which are very much along the same lines? I don't want crazy things to be done to me. I want to have emotional distress relieved. I want my religious practices to be respected, that kind of things. And again, you will read it on the paper that is coming. But should we have higher aspirations? When I looked at the list that came from the literature, I said, that's a very sad list for the biggest event of our lives, what justifies our lives, which is our death. That's how death should be perceived. Okay. And this is where this piece hit me. And, and uh, it's entitled Till Death by Margaret Ambridge. She was telling me it took her five years to convince the funders to provide double beds to places where people were dying 
alone in single bed with their spouses sitting on a chair because there wasn't room on the bed. Five years to get a double bed, for God's sake. If I'm going to die, I would like Martha to be hugging with me. Five years to get a double bed. Delivered. Why? Oh, because the nurses, their backs would hurt to mobilize people from a double bed going reaching out to the middle. Is that a good enough reason? So what if, another big what if, and this inspired by a physicist who won the Nobel Prize many months ago, who in 1963, Denis Gabor, issued a challenge to us. He said, we cannot predict the future. We researchers make extraordinary efforts to come up with numbers to help us predict the future. We cannot do it. But we seem to be ignoring that evidence. We cannot predict anything. But what if we could create the future? So he said, the future cannot be predicted, but the future can be created. What if we could create the future? We just published a book with Emilio Herrera from the Health, New Health Foundation and his team, entitled Beginning from the End. What if we could curate, like an experience, a meaningful experience, how we live, until our last breath. How about dying healthy? So we had to spend three years reconceptualizing health, away from the absence of disease, away from a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, which makes it impossible for everybody. Who can claim complete physical, mental, and social well-being? And that's what the World Health Organization proposed in 1948 and hasn't changed it as the definition of health. So we came up with this one, to turn health into an ability, an ability to adapt to the physical, mental, and social challenges that life presents to us. A lot to do with resilience. How about dying happy? I want to die happy. I want to die healthy and happy. And Gandhi said, happiness is what happens when you align what you think, what you say, and what you do. I added there what you want to feel. And that brings us to a, or an astronomical term, which is called CCG, is the alignment of planets. I want to die in a way in which what I would like to feel is aligned with what I do or is done to me. CCG. I would like to die in love. And we have been studying love a lot. We don't talk about love. We don't look at love seriously. So for the time being, I would say that love is our ability to transform goodness into pleasure. What we consider as good, use it to get joy. So we need to will good, do good, see good, and feel good. But we need to start with ourselves. We need to love ourselves first. And that's the golden rule. You see, love your neighbor as you love yourself, okay? You need to love yourself before you love your neighbor. Are we loving ourselves enough? 50% of physicians in North America are burnt out. 60% of nurses, burnt out. I haven't seen the latest numbers in palliative care. I don't even know if we have reliable numbers in palliative care. Compassion fatigue, we tend to call it. Yeah. Are we putting our oxygen mask on first? Are we learning from aviation? How much are we protecting ourselves, you see? And we hear that on the planes. In the unlikely event of a decompression, masks will fall, fall down, okay, grab yours. Even if you're looking after somebody, put your own mask on first. Are we loving ourselves first? Unconditionally, intensely, so we can love our patients and their families unconditionally and intensely. Now I need to wrap up. Because we have one entity about which we really don't talk a lot. And this is Anthony Mello, who wrote a little uh, um, parables that were found after he died. And one of them has a master and a disciple talking. And the, dis the disciple asked the master, what is love? And the master says, the total absence of fear. And what is that we fear more than anything else, the disciple said. 
and the master replied, love. So what would we do if we had no fear? How would palliative care look like? How close, how much closer we could get to enabling everybody in the world to experience a good death. And I'm going to break the rules here. I came from very far. I know I'm going a little over the time limit, but I want to share this with you. You have to put your back where your mouth is. So I curated my own funeral with the support from my family. This was for my 50th birthday. <laughs> and they gave me my coffin as a surprise, by the way. <laughs> because I said I want to celebrate my funeral because I go to a lot of them and I see people there. I have been with them and they left a lot of things unsaid. And, and a lot of people around them left a lot of things, things unsaid and now they are saying it at the funeral. So what if I removed fear? What if I removed regret? And I fear death a lot. So I spent five years with Murray Enkin preparing for my own death. Sent handwritten letters to people I had hurt, apologizing. I met with people. I said, forgive me. I said, for what? I had been carrying a lot of things in my head for decades. They didn't even remember. Yeah? I thanked those who had helped me. And I enabled Martha and the kids to spend time with me in private, telling me what they would do at my funeral. But we worked to make sure that what they said to me at that point was what they would like to say to me and what I wanted to hear. So we had to deal with a lot of issues ourselves in a very explicit way, dealing with our fears about hurting each other and going across lines that are very uncomfortable. And they closed the casket and they carried me with my music. I have, I have my funeral music which is what my alarm clock plays every morning. <laughs> so I remember when I wake up that I could have been dead and I need to experience whatever the day is going to show me in the most intense possible way, without fear. And they opened the casket and they helped me come out. <laughs> and I made a deal with them. I said, now I'm 50, the only realization I have is that I have much less to live than what I have lived already. So I don't know how much time I have left, but I'm going to divide that time in units, one hour each, and I'm going to call them life units. And I'm going to follow Nietzsche's advice. I'm going to, and he said, what would you say to a magical creature who would offer you the opportunity to relive your life an infinite number of times without changing anything? Would you take it? And Nietzsche said, most people say, no, thank you. But what if we think forward? What would it take for me to leave each of my life units in such a way that if I had the opportunity to relive it an infinite number of times, I would say yes. And that requires eliminating fear. And that requires paying attention to a beautiful word, the last one that Cyrano of Bergerac said, panage, style. What if we died in style, in our own terms, and we enabled each other to do it? What if we view death as a work of art? What would it take? That would be a good death for sure. And what would be for me? What would be for you and for you and for your mother and for your patients and for your sister, for your kids? And that's a conversation I hope we can have. And now truly to finish, Alan Watts said to go out with a bang instead of a whimper. Because now we are going with a whimper if we are not intubated. Because not even that we can have. How about an institution for creative dying? How about a hospital for delightful dying? And now research on psychedelics, on psilocybin, are showing that they may help us eliminate the, the fear of death. How about the, using those innovations? Okay. How about music? How about great food? How about massage? I prescribe food massage and, and, and smoothies with opioids. And poetry, Neruda poetry. Hmm? Are we prepared to draw outside the lines? Are we prepared to become the best for the world as individuals and as a collective? 
And this is a question that can only be answered by ourselves. How could I be the best? Not in the world. Only one person can be that. How can I be the best for the world so that together we can enable everybody to have a good day? Thank you very much. I thought I got away with the hug. He's a hugger. He's not a handshaker. We need more hugs, by the way. Alex Haddad. There's not a great deal I can say after that. But I'm really pleased to introduce to you someone who I think is, well, is, is going to meet that and match that and, and contrast that and complement that, I think, in a really beautiful and challenging way.